Now, back to the show. This is The Law Show on CL 650. This is research. Huh? This is, this is uh, well, this is uh, old school TV yeah. from the 70s. Yeah. This is Night Court. Yeah. <laughs> it's the Law Show on CIO 650. Our guests in studio, Gordon, Gordon Maynard <laughs> and Rudy K- Kisher from Maynard Kisher Stoichevich, immigration lawyers from Vancouver. Uh, we're talking about citizenship issues here in the wake of Canada Day and all those swearing-in ceremonies. We've gotten to a lot of matters today. Uh, Gordon raised a couple of things in the last segment about revocation or the government giving itself permission to take away citizenship. It's always been there, but the whole process has changed very dramatically. And you wanted to also speak to the matter of intent. And what do you mean by intent? Uh, This is a new requirement under the revised Citizenship Act. And that is that applicants for a grant of citizenship, in addition to showing that they've been in Canada for the right amount of time, etc., also have to declare that they intend, as Canadian citizens, they intend to live in Canada. Okay. They have to provide that declaration of intent. All right. Now, is there a minimum? Are we back to 183 days no, a year? No, no, no. no. This, this is counting. completely undefined. Completely undefined. So there's no sort of, yeah, you have to intend to reside in Canada. I mean, to keep your residency obligation, you have to stay in Canada 40% of the time over a five-year period. Right, and that's why you're in the process of becoming a citizen. Yeah. Now so, that you've been granted citizenship, you still have to maintain some residence Well, it doesn't say that. Doesn't not say not that. once you're granted. It says when you apply, you have to have the intent to reside in Canada. Ah. So the day after you become a citizen, if you change your mind, you could leave Canada. Well, uh, no, that's and, an unfair suggestion. What? Don't say the day after. Let's say somebody has been a citizen for 10 years and something arises that requires them to go abroad. Yeah. Now, can the government come back and say, you have now breached your intent? I think they could. I think you're at risk. I think whereas Canadians before, the, the, uh, those lovely people that we saw on Wednesday yeah. taking their oath with, you know, uh, the, the red and white flags everywhere, they were, they knew that they could leave tomorrow if something happened and go back perhaps from, from where their family is if their mother was sick and they had to go back and be back there for several months to take care of a family member sure. that was ill. They wouldn't have to sit there in the back of their mind going, wow, is somebody going to come after me? and take away my Canadian citizenship. Because I'm going to go back home and look after mum for a yeah. few weeks. Now, the, the person who gets called, who, who becomes a citizen next year, if we're having the same conversation, those people, they'll have to be thinking, they're, they're swearing their oath, Yes. Saying that they're going to be uh, that they're they're going to be loyal to the queen and uh, they're you know they're taking up an oath of Canadian citizenship, and they have to leave now. They made the application before saying that they had the intent to reside in Canada. They're going to be thinking to themselves, well, am I going to be in Pro, did I misrepresent? Can the government come after me now and say, we think you lied when you filled out your application to become a citizen, and maybe when you took the oath, I'm not sure if it's clear of, of when they'll be talking about, right. but did you lie when you made that application, and we're going to revoke your citizenship? And as Gordon was talking about earlier, that revocation process is way easier with very few, almost so, very few safeguards. So the, in, the intent falls into the same category as, uh, as we've already discussed, misrepresentation, because you said you were going to stay around and you got on a plane two days after you swore yourself in. You're out of here. So, and there's, But it's the same lack of the appeal process applying to this as well, Gordon? Yep. And, and plus it's very ill-defined. Now, I remember when this provision was proposed in the first readings of the bills, there, there was discussion with the government about where are you going with this? Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, <laughs> are you going to say that anybody who leaves Canada after becoming a citizen is in breach of their intent that they declared and that now you're going to go after them for misrep? They said, oh, no, 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 no. This is only your intent at the time that you become a citizen. But then you're talking about a decision being but made if, by an arbitrary official, a the, minor official in the immigration department. You know what this reminds me of? Years ago, when the government changed the Immigration Act, it used to be that you were inadmissible to Canada if you had convictions in Canada, mm-hmm. and you could be deported because of those convictions, or convictions outside of your outside of Canada. Mm-hmm. And then they changed to say, we don't need convictions. If we have reasonable grounds to believe that you committed an offense, we can say you're inadmissible. Okay. And that's the way the law is right now. Right. And they said, well, the reason we're bringing this in is we want to go after the mafia figures, people that we know are dirty, but they don't have any convictions. Mm-hmm. That's who we're going to use it for. Who do they use it for? Anybody who's been charged with impaired driving can fall subject to that rule. People who confess to having smoked dope mm. can be fall subject to that rule. 
I don't think I've ever seen it used for mafia figures, but I've seen it used for a lot of ordinary people. All right. So, you know, when they say intent is only something that we're going to look at at the time that you make the oath or at the time that you make your application, then why are you putting it in here in the first place and where are you really going with this? Is it I mean, safe to say, I mean, we've, got, we've only got a minute left, and is it safe to say that all of those people we saw last Wednesday had the assistance of a lawyer through the process to get, is it, is it such a maze, Rudy, that now you pretty much have to have a lawyer just to get it done right? I, I think if you're looking, as we talked about at the beginning of the show, starting the immigration process, I think it's worthwhile going to talk to a lawyer. Um, the people that are getting their citizenship, a lot of citizenship cases people do on their own, but it's good to talk to somebody to make sure that you're not sort of stalling, waiting to apply when you could apply, or applying and wasting your time and wasting your money. So I think, you know, even if you're not, uh, w while you may not need a lawyer for the entire process, and most of the people don't have one, it doesn't hurt to come in and talk to somebody to make sure that you're going the, the right route when you start your process. Well, especially with the rep the, the frequency of changes, and and uh, I, I would think, uh, particularly to the layperson, the immigration file is huge and very, very complicated. So I would hope that uh, people are calling lawyers, just if, as you say, maybe not to, to hold your hand through the whole thing, but at least to give you the lay of the land and what you're up against. Yeah, it's better, uh, you know, for, forewarned is forearmed. So I, th I think it's uh, to everybody's benefit to be educated on what they're applying for. Well, I appreciate your uh, taking some time this morning to help us understand a little bit more about uh, Canadian citizenship and all that it entails. I appreciate it very much. Gordon Maynard, Rudy Kisher, thanks so much, gentlemen. Thanks, we'll Sterling. See you again Thanks, soon. Sterling. And we'll see you next time right here on The Law Show.